Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of 2 Samuel, and today we are in chapter 2. Starting from verse 1, we pick up from where we left off yesterday with the lamentation of that David had uh, prepared uh, primarily to uh, remember the heroes of Israel who had fallen, particularly Saul and Jonathan, uh, to remember what they have done. And he is, after all, God's Mashiach, uh, the anointed of God to be the king of Israel. Now in chapter 2, then it came about afterward, after all the mourning has been done, said and done. And David had gone to ask of the Lord. The word here is ask. And uh, the idea here is to, uh, to seek an answer. To seek an answer. Of the Lord, saying... Shall I go up to one of the cities of Judah? Now, at this point in time, you must remember that David is in Ziklag. Ziklag is a city that was given to David and his men. Uh, and they are there and they are mourning Saul and Jonathan. And after all said and done, David went to ask of God. Now, this is very important for us to remember. Where is he supposed to go next? Where? And so, shall I go up to one of the cities of Judah? Now, Judah would be in the southern region. Basically, not too far away from Sigla. And the Lord said to him, Go up. So David said, where shall I go up? Notice this, go up. And he said to Hebron. And so the idea here is Zikla is lower in its terrain. And Hebron is higher in the terrain. And so from Zikla to Hebron, it is to go this, this is how we read the text itself. And so we read that he goes up. In verse 2, he went up there with his two wives. Notice he had two and he married them at the same time. Ahi Noam, the Jezreelitess from Jezreel. And Avigail, the widow of Naval from Carmel. That would be the two wives. And they are going to Hebron. So from Zikla to Hebron. In verse 3, David brought up his men with him, each with his household, and they settled in the cities of Hebron. So Hebron is a location. Uh, it is also a place near Machpelah, uh, the tombs of the patriarchs of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And surrounding Hebron would be many cities. And so they went to the cities of Hebron. So that's where they went. Not Hebron itself, but some of the cities that surround it. So the area is Hebron. Verse 4, then the men of Judah, the people of Judah came and came to David. And there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Now, as it is written here, the house of Judah is the southern part, the southern kingdom. And they told David, saying, it is the men of of Yabesh Gilad, who buried Saul. This tells him that it was 
men of this location that gave dignity to Saul. And that in the Hebrew sense is a very honorable thing. Coming to verse 5. So David sent messengers to the men of Yabesh Gilad and said to them, May you be blessed of the Lord because you have shown this kindness to Saul our Lord and have buried him. So you should be able to see this. This is an A and this is a B. Shown kindness to the Lord. So showing kindness is having buried him. And it's about dignity. And in Hebrew culture, now you need to bury the body by the time it was sunset. And this is to treat the body with dignity and not hanging up there. And so this in itself is kindness. The idea of kindness here uh, I guess in verse 5, um, this is chesed. So loving kindness is not just a feeling. Loving kindness can be seen in the actions of these people. And so the men actually treated Saul with loving kindness. Verse 6. Now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. And I also will show this goodness to you because you have done this thing. So understand that there is a sense of, of, um, of, of, of agreement. And there's a sense of, uh, 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 of thankfulness that uh, Saul was treated with dignity by these men of Yabesh Gilad. And so not only that they have shown kindness to Saul, may God show kindness. And this word is also chesed. The second word is emet. And this would be faithfulness or truthfulness. That God will show kindness and faithfulness to you all. And then I myself will show you uh, what is good. This goodness means what is good. This will be told. Now, just a brief moment to, to digress. Tov is in the eyes of the beholder. And so when David says, I will show you this goodness or what is good, it will also be what is good in the eyes of the men of Yabesh Gilad. Because why, did, why is David saying all this? Because you have done this thing, that you've shown dignity to Saul and his sons. Verse 7. Now then, let your hands be strong and be valiant. Since Saul, your Lord, is dead, also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. And so what we have seen is now David is made Mashiach. And this is over the house of Judah. Now we draw a line here. Right here. Why do we need to draw a line? So that everything before verse 7, we are talking about the house of Judah. Right? What happened and and they had Saul as king. Now that Saul has died, the house of Judah is actually anointing David to be the king over them. Since we have kings, so the next king will be David. 
Now we come to verse 8. Verse 8 says, And of Nair, the son of Nair, the commander, or you can say he is the general of Saul's army, had taken Ish Bosheth, Ish Bosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Machanaim. Now, Machanaim is a place in Genesis 32. So let me just put this down. Genesis 32, verse 2, uh, Jacob named the place uh, Machanaim, uh, is a place of two camps. When he was having Jacob's camp, and then the angels came to minister to him. And so this is called Machanaim. And Ish Boshet is now the focus. This would be the house of Saul. Now, at this point in time, it is important for us to realize that Avner wants to make Ish Boshet, the son of Saul, as the king. Now, I want to bring us back uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 13 reading from verse 13 and 14. So I want to bring your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 to 14. And let me just read that to you. Verse 13 says this, And Samuel said to Saul, After Saul um, made his sacrifices without waiting for Samuel, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. Do not give a sacrifice. You are not the right person to do that. You need to be a priest to do that. You need to be a Levite to do that. And, and, and he is neither. For which God commanded you, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. If you hadn't done that, the kingdom will be yours for a long time. In verse 14, But now your kingdom shall not continue, and now your kingdom shall come to an end eventually. The Lord has sought himself a man after his own heart. Now the man after his own heart is David, that we know, and the Lord has commanded him, David, to be commander over his people, God's people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And so by this, we know that the kingdom is not going to be continued in the sons of Saul, but in a man that God has chosen, a man after his own heart, which we know is David. David is now anointed as the king over the house of Judah. But we have the northern kingdom. For now, we call it the house of Saul. Because Saul is ruling over the entire northern part. And so, Avner has made Ishbosheth. The, the king over the northern parts. Verse 9. Made him king over Gilad, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, Benjamin, and even over all Israel. Now the idea of all Israel uh, it's important for us to realize uh, that this is the northern, the northern part of Israel. The southern part is called Judah. And so what we see now is that we have seen in verse 7 that the southern part has made David king or anointed him 
king. The northern part, Avner has made Ish Boshe king. He's the son of Saul. And so now we have two kings over the entire land of Israel, but David is king over Judah. Ishbosheth is king over Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he was king for two years. Two years. That's it. Then the house of Judah followed David. So we now see that the north, Ishbosheth, two years, the south, David, a number of years. We will read about that uh, shortly. Verse 11 the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. This is important because we have this piece of information David in Hebron was seven years and six months. Now we find that later in 2 Samuel, what happened after seven years and six months? Well, after seven years and six months, he would have conquered Jerusalem. And he moved from Hebron to Jerusalem, and he brought the tabernacle with him over there. And so this is a very important piece of information over the house of Judah, and something happens along the way. Now, how did Ishbosheth only rule for two years, and David rule for seven years and six months over the house of Judah in Hebron? Well, we'll read about it as we go on. Verse 12, and Avner, the son of Ner, went from Machanaim to Gibeon with the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul. Verse 13, and Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon, and they sat down. Avner's men sat on one side of the pool and Joab's men sat on the other side of the pool. Now there is a pool in Gibeon. This pool is a place where the men were contesting one side to the other. So we have Joab and his men And then we have Avner and his men, right? They are to do something. They are to have a duel. They are to fight with each other. Verse 14, that Avner said to Yoav, now have the young men arise and hold a martial skills match in our presence. Now, what is a martial skills match? Um, it is interesting for us to know that this word, a martial skills match, comes from the word... Uh, Shahak, right? Shahak or, or Sahak. It comes, is related to the word Yitzhak. Yitzhak means to laugh. And Yitzhak is the name uh, Isaac. And so Sahak means to play. To be joyful, 
uh, to have a sport, right? To have a sport to compete with each other. Not, so it's not necessarily uh, a duel or a fight, but something happens in verse uh, 15 onwards. So in verse 15, we find that they got up, the young men got up, went over by count, 12 for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 from the servants of David. And so these people that came out were 12 verses 12. Verse 16, and each of them seized his opponent by the head and thrust his sword into his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called um, Helkat Hatzurim, right? Helkat Hatzurim, which is in Gibeon. Now, there was something terrible that happened here and people died. What turned out to be a little uh, sport that they can enjoy? Well, the day the battle was very severe. It turned into from a play into a war. And Abner and the men of Israel were defeated by the servants of David. Now, there were three sons of Zeruiah. Now, who is Zeruiah? Zeruiah? Uh, Zeruiah is the sister of David. That would make these three gentlemen, Yoav, uh, Avishai, and Ashael. Three of them would be the nephews of David. And Yoav himself becomes a general in the army of David. And then Ashael was swift-footed as one of the gazelles that were in the field, meaning he could run fast. He could run fast. Verse 19. Asael chased after Afna and did not turn to the left or to the right from following Afna. What does that mean? So you have Ash Asa Asahel, and he was chasing the behind of Afna. And this phrase here, do not turn to the right or to the left, means to stay on course. Because if you had taken a different direction, you will not be able to catch Afna. And so Asahel chased and stayed on course after Afna, verse 20. Then Afna looked behind him and said, is that you, Asahel? And he said, it is I. Verse 21. Then Afna said to him, turn aside for your own good to your right or to your left. That's the opposite of what he was set out to do, that he would not turn away left or right and he would pursue uh, Afna. And so Afna said, just turn to the left or right Take hold of one of the young men for yourself and take for yourself his equipment. Maybe you just take and beat one of the soldiers and go home. But Asahel was unwilling to turn aside from following him. Verse 22, that after repeated again to Asahel, turn aside for your own good from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I show my face to your brother, Joab? For whatever it's worth, their armies are good friends. Joab knows uh, Afna and Afna knows Joab. But right now, uh, Afna is being chased by uh, Joab. In verse 23, 
So after uh, what you can see is but he refused to turn right he would be a sahel he refused to turn so afna struck him in the belly with the butt end of the spear so the spear came back out on his back and he fell there and died on the spot and it happened that all who came thereafter to the place where Asahel had fallen and died stood still. This was the terrible thing that happened that after in self-defense killed Asahel, one of the nephews of Saul were killed. In verse 24, but Yoav and Avishai pursued after. And when the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amma, which is opposite Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. Right? Gibeon. The idea here is they Yoav and Avishai, the two other brothers, came after after as well. And the sons of Benjamin gathered together behind after and came one troop and they stood up on the top of a hill. They were trying to take over after, but they failed. Verse 26. After called to Yoav, why do you want to chase me? And said, should the sword de devour forever? And then he says, um, do you not real do you not realize that it will be bitter in the end? Uh, the idea of bitter means um, it would be discontentment, right? It would be discontentment. So how long will you still refrain from telling the people to turn back from pursuing their kinsmen? And so Athena says, why do you send people after your kinsmen? They shouldn't because we are warriors and they have not been there in a day of battle. But Yoav was persistent. Yoav was persistent. And Yoav said, as God lives, this is an oath. This is a promise. Because if you had not spoken, then the people of Judah certainly would have withdrawn in the morning, each from pursuing his brother. Now, Joab said this as God lives. This is a formal oath. This is swearing to God that if you had not spoken, then the people of Judah would not be participating in this. Verse 28, so Joab blew the trumpet and all the people halted and no longer pursued Israel, nor did they continue in the fight anymore. Now we read in verse 28 is that Yoav is beginning to uh, assemble themselves again to fight this battle. And this would be strictly between Yoav um, and uh, Afna. In verse 28, Yoav blew the trumpet. This word here is shofar. And then all the people halted and no longer pursued Israel. I think this is a, a, a wrong perception if we just read the English. You find that it says all the people, it means everyone who is there, not all the people in the world, but all the people who were in, uh, in at the time uh, of, 
of Hebron, uh, chasing after each other, Yoav needed them to realize that it is not worth chasing them, nor did they fight, continue to fight anymore. Many people have died in this so-called games. Avner and his men then went through the Arava all that night. So they crossed the Jordan, walked all morning, and came to Machanaim. This is important because he went down south and then he came back north to Gilad area. Verse 30. Then Job returned from pursuing Avner, but he gathered all the people together. The 19 and 19 of David's servants were missing, besides Asahel. So you find that the distraction here is we uh, gathered the people together, but we find that this battle had no good ending. Uh, Asahel had died. Uh, the servants of David had struck. Many of Benjamin and Afna's men, 360 of them, we read in verse 32 uh, that they carried Asahel uh, and buried him in his father's tomb, uh, which was in Bethlehem. Uh, Bethlehem. Then jo Joab and his men traveled all night until day had dawned at Hebron. We now find that in this particular narrative in chapter 2, uh, there begins the problem. The problem is who is going to be king in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 to 14, God says, I, I don't want your descendants. But Aphna had already made uh, the, the choice uh, and had actually given the northern kingdom to Ish-bosheth. And now we need to come to terms with this. Why did they actually fight uh, and how did they manage to come to this ending was because the northern side still have uh, Avner, the general of Saul, thinking that the son of Saul should assume the, the throne. Uh, the role as king. And in the southern nation of Judah, the house of Judah, uh, had anointed David as king. And with this, we have come to, I guess, uh, the end of chapter 2, where we now have a discordant nation, where the north has one king, the south has another king, and the northern king is the son of Saul, and the southern king is Judah. Now, how do we deal with this as we come together tomorrow in chapter 3? This entire uh, problem will be resolved. And the words of God in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, that the kingdom of Saul will come to an end, literally comes to an end in chapter 3. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.